Hi y'all, welcome to that Sunday School Girl channel where you have just joined in the largest cyber community of Sunday School students. Where our goal here is simply this, to change the way that you see Sunday School. Hey, we are under the great leadership of evangelist Waynell Henson, who God has handpicked, chosen, matured, and grown, prepared for such a time as this, where we are able to use this cyberspace to be able to present many different Sunday School lessons from many different publishers and in nominations and we are so excited here today that we are continuing on this great work of Sunday School. Hey here I am Reverend Charles Nelson and I will be this week's presenter for the International Sunday School lesson also known as the ISSL for May 5th 2024. This is the lesson 10 in this spring quarter for 2024. Hey as we get ready to prepare to dig into today's lesson I was just thinking about something I heard it was a while ago someone they was having a conversation and the question came up don't be flexing on me and I was like flexing what, what do you mean by that flexing that that is a word that really has this connotation of, of um, blowing one's own trumpet to to over exaggerate to show off to gloat in front of others and this flex it made me think about that term when I looked at today's one of today's Sunday school lesson and when it says no need to boast hey is there someone in your life or some things in your life you see people always bragging and boasting about people are always showing off or they're always exaggerating their relevance they're always blowing their own trumpet well, in this Sunday school lesson here today we're going to look and see that when it comes down to being right before God that no one has a right to boast. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, we ask you, Lord, to come now and just speak to us, Lord. Speak to me, Lord, and speak through me, Lord. Speak in spite of me, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. We, your servants, are listening. So speak, Lord, that we may have spiritual food to, to go on the journey that you have set before us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hello to every one of you. Hello, TSSG family. Hello, TSSG family. You're in the TSSG space. Well, hello, TSSG family. Sunday, 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 Changing the way you see Sunday school with that Sunday school. Hey, all right. So look, as we have just already reviewed or shown that one of our Sunday school lessons title is um, "No Need to Boast." One of the other one of the other writers for the International Sunday School Lessons. Uh, one of those writers uses the title "Justified by." faith, justified by faith. I'm going to be looking at it primarily from the first title mentioned that there is no need to boast, standing in the faith. Hey, when I just thought about these things here, we're talking about faith. We are still thinking about faith. Last last month, we saw faith in action. There is an action that ought to be accompanied with faith, faith in action, faith that moves, faith that can be seen. But here, not only do we see a faith that is in action, but we are going to begin in this month to be able to look at the characteristics and qualities of the foundation of faith. We, we've been looking at how faith is used, how we can see the fruitfulness, if I should put it that way, we can see the fruit of our faith. But here we're going to see the foundation of faith. Hey, let's go ahead. Let's dig right on into our lesson here. We are going to be looking at the printed passage today. It's coming out of um, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, um, verses 21 through 30. Verses 21 through 30. Before we dig into this text, we uh, can identify that when we look at the beginning of Romans, it is Paul that identifies himself as being the writer of this book. And if you look and upload the study notes, you will see more details on how we can come to that conclusion about the author. And also not only the author, but also the, um, the audience. The audience. His original audience would have been a combination of both Gentiles and Jews. And he had Gentiles in Jews that was all up under that in that un umbrella of of Rome. Uh, it, it was it was decreed um, a few years before he had wrote um, that all the uh, all the Christian Jews had been run out from Rome. 
And so during up that time, all of those Christians had moved away from Rome. But in the meantime, in the between time, before they came back some odd years later, there was a Gentile population that had began to accept the teachings of Jesus. But they began to accept the gospel. They began to accept the good news that Jesus came, died, and was rose from the grave, all for the remission for, of our sins, that we can have a right relationship with God. They, it was Gentile that had began to embrace this message. It was Gentiles that began to hold on to the gospel, but yet they weren't doing things quite like the Jews were doing. So now when the Jews come back, there was this tension, there was this turmoil, there was this struggle that would take place about who had the bragging rights, who had the reasons to boast. So Paul, when he opens up this letter, he spends this first two, um, excuse me, three and a half chapters just laying down this foundation, stripping both sides, the Gentiles and the Jews, of being able to realize that they have no right to boast. They have nothing to brag upon, even though the Gentiles was probably um, uh, um, the majority in number. They did not have a majority in stake in the gospel. And just because the Jews can have the um, 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 the majority, be the majority when it comes down to the historicity, when it comes down to tracing their lineage all the way back to Abraham, when it come down to those different types of things, even though they may have had a majority in that, it was not enough to give them a foothold to be able to fight um, with it came down to the standards that God has set before his people. Hey, when we're looking at this lesson, we're going to be looking at things comparing justified by the law and works with being justified by faith in Christ. We're going, one of our other lesson aims is, is to be, to be able to value your faith and Jesus Christ. And thirdly, thirdly, to become more intentional about reflecting genuine faith in daily activities. These are the three lesson aims that is presented to us throughout one of the publisher writers. And we're going to go right on in. We're dealing with Romans chapter three, verses 21 through 26. And, uh, <clears throat> Um, this lesson is broken down into two sections. The first section of the analysis of the biblical text, it says that there, um, it says there is only one way. And that is dealing with verses 21 through 26. And then in verses 27 through 30, we hear this phrase, there's nothing to boast about. So let us look right on into this here, reading this from the New International Version, also known as the NIV. He says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his own, uh, his, excuse me, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. That is there out of the NIV, also known as the New International Version. When I was just looking at this here, I find it very interesting. We see this phrase, but now, that is presented unto us. I kind of broke into some of it, but we will dig a little bit deeper as we continue to move on, move forward. But if you look at your study notes, you'll have more of a of an outline or an outlay of what that would look like. Now, um, Paul, he's as he's going through and he's building this case about um being able to hold on to the law because the Jews, that's what the Jews would have been. You got to, you got to be circumcised. You, you got to be doing things this way. You, you got to come to church looking like this. You got to wear hats. If you're a woman, you got to be having, wearing your skirt and you, you got the full finger from your, um, from your, from your, from your knee, you know, that measurement and, and man, you got to, you got to have your black suits on first Sunday and your black tie. And you know, they, they will have all these laws that would be needed in order for you to fit what it looks like 
to be a, a Christian. And they, they had, they had in particular in that days, that they would have to go back and be circumcised physically. And then they will have to identify themselves in some other ways. But Paul, he wants, he's going to tear down some of these different things throughout the book of Romans. And here he says, you know, knowing that, that we cannot be justified by the law. The law was simply there to reveal to us whether or not we were being obedient to the law. And when I drive down the street and I see um, a speed sign that tells me the speed limit, even though it may say the speed limit is 45 and I'm driving a car that the speedometer says 120, I have to make a choice. I can utilize and exercise the, the, the abilities that I may have within my car or I could choose to obey the rules that the that the, the that the um that the law has placed out. Now notice that even just seeing the sign or the sign being there or that being the law, that in itself does not make me a law-abiding citizen. It is what I believe in and what how I maneuver. I could believe, well, you know, if I drive six or seven miles over the speed limit, I won't get pulled over. Just because I believe that don't mean that that's the law. But anyway, I just wanted to be able to show that even even in their sense, they were. Um, equating their um, um, holding fast to the to the law would be what could make them just, what can make them to be presented unto God. And so here we got, the, but now the righteousness of God, uh, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And so simply saying the righteousness is mes is manifested. This manifested is it's being revealed. It has come down. It has been identified. Even though that when we look at the Old Testament, that's what that phrase means, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even though the Old Testament um, can be a witness, it gives testimony of the righteousness of God. We know that first of all, we can learn one thing about this righteousness. And let me just break that word down to you in a very similar sense. This is this righteousness, this standard that God has set before man. Just like the street sign would tell us the speed limit. And that's the standard that the state, the county, the city have set before the people. This righteousness is a standard that has been set. Notice the text says that it's of God. That means that lets me know right now this righteousness that everyone is in seek that is seeking of, it, it belongs to God. This righteousness that is given, it is packaged up. This gift is packaged up in through faith. It is about what we believe. And in this case, who we believe in. Why do I say that? It says through faith. In Jesus Christ, not our faith in the preacher, not our faith in Big Mama, not in faith in, in the deacon, not in faith in the song, but our faith in Jesus Christ. And who is this all for? To all, all who believe. You see it in verse 22, that small word, three letters, all. We see it once in 22. We see it once in 23. We see it once in 24. This statement of all lets me know that this, even though this is something that is being exclusively coming from God, it is inclusive for everyone to receive. But the parameter that is set, it didn't just say to all, as some would have you to believe that this righteousness is, is everybody is going to get it. No, Paul tells us that it's to all who believe. Notice in verse 22, before he goes on, he says, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. It, 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 so we see right here, he said that you can't, you can't be righteous by the law. You, you can't look at your genealogy and see all the folks that have went on before you to be able to identify. It, 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 he's tearing down these different things. Yes, it, you know, we got some folks that, that got generations of generations upon generation of preachers and pastors and deacons and evangelists and church folks. And they have built this church and planted that church and built this ministry. And you could go through your fathers and, and grandfathers and uncles and aunties and see all of these great things that generations before have done. And then it makes you feel feel like you may be entitled. Paul hears, he says, you are not entitled when it comes down 
to being a Jew. And then hold on, wait a minute. He says, and Gentile, you, you don't have to worry about not being enough because you are Gentile. Um, and here we are in verse 23. He says this it, with this four statement, letting us know he's about to reveal something that falls into both camps, falls into both the Jews and the Gentiles. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All, that's that word again. But this second half of this verse, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This glory of God, this standard that God has set up, everyone has fallen short. So you may be able to talk about your sin and compare it to everybody else's sin, but when it comes down to the standard that God has presented, you have to compare it to his standard. And here Paul says, regardless of what goes on between y'all, you still have missed God's standard. So this is why we need something that comes from, from somewhere else. This righteousness that belongs to God. This righteousness that is beneficial to all who believe. And also, it's for us. In verse 24, he says, look at here. He says, he talks about, first of all, that all have sinned. He says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. But then in verse 24, he says, all are justified freely by his grace. Isn't that good to be able to see this gift of grace? He's given gifts. The righteousness is given through faith. And here in verse 20, that was in verse 22 and verse 24, and are justified freely by his grace. Who is this his that he is talking about? He is talking about the same one, the same thing that, that we are free, freely given by God's grace, by God's grace. God did it. Hold up. Wait a minute. Because our sins, when we look at the totality of the book of Romans, we'll realize that our sins draws this greatest offense against God. But God is the same one that even though we have sinned and fallen short of his glory, it is God that is the one that is packaging up a gift to give unto us to, so that we are justified. Well, what do you mean by justified? Justified can be simply said in this manner, just as if. He, make, he don't make us sinless, but we are declared Sinless. We, it's like we are walking to the courtroom. We know we are guilty. They got our fingerprints. They got DNA. They got video surveillance. They got audio. They got a confession. They, they, they see, there is no way that you can walk up out of this courtroom without being declared guilty. But somehow, some way, before the judge hit that gravel on the bench, he says, I'm going to declare you free. Hold up. Wait a minute. It goes against everything that we believe and think of. But that's what it is when we are justified freely. Hey, let me continue to move on quickly here. It says that we are freely by his grace. Notice that it says this grace, how it's coming through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This redeeming power that was able to purchase this redemption. It re it's a purchasing plan. I remember Chuck E. Cheese taking my daughter there all the time, and they had those coins that you had to cash in, the, uh, redeemed. There was redeemed tickets. We would gather up all these tickets, and there was things on the other side of the counter that when we came and presented these coins to the counter, if we had enough, we can buy something from behind the counter. Think about this. God saw us and seen the need that we had that slaved, uh, that enslaved us, the sin that enslaved us. And then he sent Jesus to come down and that his blood would be the redeeming coin to present back to the slave master of sin and say, I want to buy them back. Verse 25, he says, and God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to, re to be received by faith. This is one of the things that we must be able to confess and believe in, that it was God, the Father, that presented Christ 
as the one that will be the sacrifice to really put us in position and at one with God. It is not nothing that we can do. And I know many of religions try to do work-based. We don't, we, we don't, we don't produce fruit of faith to be saved. But we have fruit of our faith when we are saved. Here, this, this by faith is simply the foundation of what we believe. And one of the foundation things that is on one of the things that's on the foundation of our faith is believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins to be atoned for, for our sins to be dealt with, that he died a death that we deserve so that we can live a life that he was worth having. <clears throat> Verse 25, he says he did this. He had a purpose to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance or in the times before, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He, it, it, he, didn't turn a, he didn't turn a blind eye to it. He did not ignore it. He just put it on pause. He held it and not had, and not had dealt with it yet. He did this to demonstrate, to show forth, to bring into reality his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justified those who have faith in Jesus. So we see here that our faith is beneficial. Why is it beneficial? We, we've seen it. <clears throat> it's beneficial because it gives us an access to this righteousness. Our, our faith in Jesus is beneficial because it is the one thing that, is, that God used to wipe all of our sins away. Our faith in Jesus is beneficial because... <clears throat> It is the one thing, the one person that God used to be able to um, um, justify us. Verse, let's go into our next section here. <clears throat> very, very quickly. It says now in verse 27, where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what, because of what law? The law that require works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, or is the God, or excuse me, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who would justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. As we look at this here, let us continue to remember this original audience that Paul is dealing with. You got Jews that are saying, you, you must be circumcised. You got the Gentiles that saying, we've been doing this like this for the last four or five years. You got the Jews saying, well, that don't mean that you saved. You got the Gentiles saying, well, well what do you mean? What is it going to take for us to be saved? And Paul is now presenting unto them these rhetorical questions to challenge on the inside of each one of them. What is it that qualifies you to be saved? Where is your boasting? Where, where is it that you can flex in this situation? Where is it that you can gloat? Where is it that you can blow your own trumpet? Where is it that you can exaggerate or show off? Where is it that you can show your talk with this excessive pride and self-satisfaction about your own achievements and abilities when it comes down? to the righteousness of God. He gives them some to think about. Can you flex because of what? Of, of, of the law? What, what law are you talking about? The, the, the law that requires works? <laughs> nah. 
That is not what justifies us before God. That is not what the righteousness of God is all about. But what it is about is about the law that requires you to have faith, a law that requires you to, to, to believe. In verse 28, he says, begins in with another four statement. It's going to put some weight on his statement. For we maintain this is something that we don't just have this, but this is maintained to actually nourish. I think about when I see this word maintain, it makes me think about the, the general maintenance on my car in order to make sure I could get the best benefit and the most out of my vehicle. I have to maintain it in a proper way. Got to get the oil change when it needs to, spark plugs change, rotate tires, do these things. This maintenance work will prevent it from breaking down. So this, we are, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That's a hard thing for many people to grapple with. But it, we are justified by believing in God. It's by our faith, what we believe in, and not attached to the law. Here he's writing off, he begins, he's going to write off a few different things. I'm not going to get into that. But anyway, in verse 29, <clears throat> he, pres he presents another chain of rhetorical questions. Or is, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Hold up, wait a minute. You mean, so now he's like, Think about this. That this doesn't even make any sense. The God that created the whole heavens and the earth, the God that with nothing in his hand threw and cast all the celestial stars into his, into his places, is the same God that causes the sun and the moon to sit in their places, to be enter, able to intertwine in so, ever so many years and causes eclipse. The same God that keeps the earth rotating on an axis and don't let it move too far where it gets too close to the sun that we will, that we will burn up but not get so far away from it that we will freeze up. The same God that is able to put other planets and places and galaxies into their celestial places is the same God that created gravity and made sure that when we jump up, we do come back down. The same God that made sure that we can know how to, that we need air to breathe is the same God that gave fish the ability to live in water. The same God that does all of these great and wonderful things. Now, you mean to tell me that this same God is just limited just to you? That's literally what he's saying. I mean, in my own words, I, he said, you think that you just got a monopoly on God? It's not this the same God that's, that's God. Of course, he's the God of the Gentiles too. And then in verse 30, he said, based off of this, it begins with this word since. Because this is the case. And, and the Gentiles don't need another God. But there is only one true God. And now he, with the Romans, he's really hitting at, in this Rome letter to the Christians, the Jewish Christians, he's really hitting all the way back to, to, their, to, their, uh, well, to their heritage, that, the one, that there's only one true God. That was something that was told into them, that, they, that was part of their prayers and everything. That since, and if this is the case, that there's only one God, who will, and notice what this God does. One of these benefits of our faith, it is God who justifies the circumcision, the circumcised, I should say, those who have been circumcised. It is not the circumcision that would justify them, but it's the faith. It's it who would justify the circumcised, the circumcised by faith. He's going to look at what, what did you believe in? Who did you believe in? Abraham, and then he said before he was circumcised, if I'm not mistaken, I will look and make sure I put it in my notes. Um, apart from, I would put it like that, apart from his circumcision, was counted as righteous. Why? Because he believed. It was his faith. And it says, and here, and the uncircumcised through that same faith. 
Makes me think about Rahab, a Gentile who believed enough and she was saved. So from this, from this, no one has no reason to boast. No one has no right to be able to flex because of their salvation. Because it was all about God and his work. And so um, this, this is our week's lesson. And let us continue to go through these weeks as we're exploring, you know, this, this whole thing with righteousness and, um, our faith, excuse me, exploring our faith and just, um, realizing the value of our faith in, in Jesus Christ. And think of some ways that we can be more intentional about reflecting genuine faith in our daily living. Hey, may God bless you. And may God keep you. That is my humble prayer for you on this evening. Thank you so much for sharing in this space with us today. If this ministry has blessed you in any way, I invite you to consider sharing a small gift of just $3 with us. You can do so by scanning one of the QR codes on the screen. And please don't forget, we are waiting for you to join us over in the TSSG Connect. You can see all the benefits here on the screen. And we look forward to serving you in a more personal way. Have you had an opportunity to visit our amazing swag shop? Stop by and check out great items for Sunday school and church school. T-shirts, pouches, mugs, and so much more. Find something that you'll enjoy or something for your favorite teacher. Sunday school with that Sunday school